Okay, this is, I want to welcome everybody to the investigative podcasting webinar here at the Global Investigative Journalism Conference. Um, I think people are starting to join us. Um, I can see there's already 20, 30 people joining us. So thanks for joining us. As we get going, uh, I just want to quickly uh, introduce myself and the panel. Uh, my name is Suzanne Reber. Um, I'm an executive producer of podcasting. I'm based in the US and I spend some time in Europe as well. But um, I'm really proud to be doing this. I've been involved with the global investigative journalism community pretty well since the beginning, which I know dates us. However, I'm proud to, uh, to wave that flag. Um, and honestly, we have been doing sessions about audio and podcasting for some time, but I can honestly say Ever, I would say since maybe South Africa, um, the the interest in podcasting has obviously skyrocketed, which is, which is essentially what's been going on with the audience. So I want to introduce our panel. We are definitely global today. Uh, we uh, want to introduce Jason, um, who's joining us from Taiwan. Um, Taya is joining us from Slovenia, and Ramsey is joining us from Amman, Jordan. Myself, you know, our stuff is is US based, but as, as we know, anything streaming related is global. And um, they're an incredible panel. They're all innovative. They have taken major risks to get into the space. And I think you'll be interested to hear some of their experience, not just in making the shows, which is the fun part, but also how the audience is responding. And so I'm gonna hand things over quickly. Uh, to Jason, who's going to kick things off. And um, we will go through our various panelists. And at the end, of course, we'll leave uh, room for all of your questions. As you, uh, as you have them, you can put them in the chat. So over to you, Jason. Thank you, Susanna. And good morning, good evening. Hello to everyone. Um, I'm Jason, based in Taiwan. And now it's almost 10 o'clock p.m. here today. So uh, it's my pleasure to be on this panel because uh, as you can see, uh, we, are only, we only have one year experience for producing uh, podcast content. So I think it's really our honor to be on this panel to share what we learned from our region, from the audience, and why we as a non-for-profit small media organization, how we start our project and how we get feedback from our donors and our audience. So today I'm gonna start with show introduction of the reporter. And then I will share uh, some clips for uh, about our show. Then I will share uh, some of the learnings from our first year, their first year journey. So uh, the Reporter Foundation itself is a nonprofit media founded in 2015. So until now we have 30 uh, people on our team. So we have only one and a half working on podcasts full time. So uh, we really have limited human resources on, for these products and we're doing weekly uh, podcast program. And for our website, there's no paywall. We get only donations only. So uh, we don't have advertisement and we don't work with governments or uh, corporates. We only get donations from individuals. So uh, that's the reporter. And the issues we work on, we investigate on, it's uh, mainly about human rights, social justice or public policy. So uh, we also do lots of cross-border uh, investigation together with medias around the world. So for example, we did like uh, fishery workers with Tempo from Indonesia. And myself, I did a investigation on the victims from Xinjiang re-education camp. So you will hear the clips from the investigation shortly. So we did lots of like every two months we'll have a one investigation reporting coming out. So for us, it's really difficult to start a new product as we are all uh, hands-on with lots of investigation with different topics. But for us, it's really critical to have podcasts because uh, we usually have long form articles as you can imagine for our investigation stories. So for the 
audience nowadays is kind of for them is kind of difficult to read all of our materials or our, our investigations. So uh, we did uh, a questionnaire with our readers actually as a starting point to plan uh, if we should or should not start our podcast products. So finally, we get almost a hundred, a thousand and six hundred questionnaires from our readers. And 95% of them say yes to, <laughs> to the podcast products. That's a good news or maybe a bad news because now we really need to do that. And we don't have anyone who is full-time doing that. So we start with uh, zero uh, to think to plan uh, what should we do. So we were really lucky. The first episode was August, 2020. And then in the first month, we are rec recommended by lots of influencers in Taiwan and in Hong Kong and some from, from mainland China. So we were, for some time, we were the top at all category on Apple Podcast Taiwan. So I, I would say we are really lucky because we did it quite early for Taiwanese medias. And then following that, in the second month, we have uh, a first meetup with our listeners. So we invited like 200 listeners in two cities to ask about their feelings and how they feel about our new products. And then we did a second round survey, like what they expect from the reporter, what they expect from the, this weekly uh, podcast program. Because uh, we really want to do, do, what we really want to do is a uh, audience oriented product. So we can really, uh, tackle on what they need as a media organization. So there are some good news following that. You see the numbers of donors increase and you see the platform partners, local partner from Taiwan KKPOX, they pay for this season to buy our show. So therefore us, it's a really big uh, revenue income from, from the, the selling of the episodes. And then we make it a habit that we do regular meetups and online QAs with our audience to get their feedback and then uh, to run like this weekly podcast program. So I would say uh, it's kind of slight, slightly different from other investigative podcasts because we do it weekly and we focus on lots of connection between uh, us, the media, the journalists, and uh, the listeners, the audience. So uh, in the end, we have this weekly podcast program. You will hear recordings from our journalists in different news events or different uh, occasions, and you get audio content from our investigation stories. And uh, me, myself, what, uh, I'm a journalist as well for 10 years. So I, now I visit lots of occasions. I do my interview with the recording uh, uh, machine. So you will see lots of free recording from the news event um, lively. And we do interviews with critical persons like the police or the policy makers or some witness. We invite them to the show to talk about their feelings and what they saw from the news events. So that's basically the main four uh, content on our show. So as now I'll play some short clips to demo what we have in our program. So first clip would be a conversation between me and my interviewee. She is from Xinjiang region from China. And she talked about her experience in the camp and her experience in the factory and to protect her. So we did some uh, editing about her voice. So you could not recognize who uh, she is, but uh, we have lots of personal experience in this conversation. And at that time, people are arguing about the cotton from, uh, from Xinjiang, are they uh, ethical or not? And there is lots of misunderstanding about what's going on in Xinjiang. So this recording becoming a proof uh, for our audience to understand what's really going on in that region. So you, you just described is you in a Hassa person who felt the experience, right? Yes. I'm curious, is the experience of in um, so you, you will hear uh, the voice are really different, cannot be, be told who she is. So we spend lots of time to re-edit her voice 
and my personally, I interview other experts uh, to, for their knowledge to have a background for the audience to understand what's going on in Xinjiang by following the personal story from her. So you see there are some pictures of the faces of the victims that uh, we did lots of interviews like uh, 20 or more than 20 if we can reach them and to get their personal stories. So that was one of the stories. So the other example would be uh, our trip to uh, Aboriginal village in the mountains or in the coastal areas, because uh, they are sometimes people have stereotype stereotype on them about their life and about their culture and about their how close they are to the criminal group. So we went there and set up the studios in the schools and then in the village and encouraged the young people to get on the, in front of the mic and talk to us. So I will show a clip to we attend the uh, rehearsal in their school about their uh, musical uh, preparing. So we will hear uh, how they sing and how they how they sounds really happy with their own culture. <笑>很有意思就是我们那个时候知道他们要跟我一起走 So these are two examples about uh, from the clips from our show. And then third thing I want to share is uh, in our show, we put lots of focus on the engagement. So what we did in the end after one year experience, uh, we share the investigation stories with our audience. But other than that, we encourage our audience to be part of the investigation, which means uh, we invite them to share their news leak about uh, their personal life, people, lots of people uh, sharing their experience with drugs or any kind of new type of drugs in their schools. So they provide us lots of news leads so our journalists can follow. And we get lots of witness of some critical news events or the, uh, the, the hidden, uh, uh, hidden topic we didn't know in a society. So we invite lots of our audience to be part of our uh, investigation. And sometimes we invite them to share their personal experience about how they got scammed or how they met uh, the criminals in, their, in different uh, villages. So uh, you can hear the personal story from them. And in the end, we, we, lot, we often ask uh, what kind of questions they have in their mind about certain topics, because we want to increase the diversity of our editorial team, which means we invite the audio audience to be part of our uh, editorial team. So they can ask their questions because sometimes journalists are too into the news. They kind of have some distance uh, between the journalists and the audience itself because you you have lots of different audience so we sometimes we i mean like once a week we ask questions on instagram so they can uh, answering or they can let us know what they have there in mind so we do a lot of engagement reporting via podcast so you see some impact from this uh, first year experiment so we got some awards I voted as the best show of the year last year um, and you see the average audience of each episode is five times of the number of each article. So people listen a lot to our stories. And you see 30% to 40% increase of the total donors in the first year of the products. Yeah, so you see lots of impact, good impact, and you, you reach the younger generations because, you know, young people now, it's really hard to ask them to read long form investigation articles, but if they can listen, they are happy to. So that's, you, you see some positive impact coming out. So some learnings. Uh, 
we are a young media organization, uh, I would say. So it's only six years since we founded and we only have spent one year on uh, podcast producing. So there's a lot of things we need to learn and a lot of lessons we have from the first year. I would say the basic is how to persuade your journalists to record everything when they are investigating. It's harder than I thought. So um, I spend lots of time training or talk to them. Like uh, even you're walking with your interviews in the mountains, that would be helpful for us. So first step would be to record everything when investigating, if you want to start an investigation uh, podcast. And secondly, less numbers and academic materials, because for us, we always started with numbers and uh, research, important research to start an investigation, if, especially if uh, international topics. But that's really not helpful for the people to listen to the stories. So more human, more conversation, that's what we learned. Um, do we early update at least weekly, because if we want to be part of the uh, people's life, uh, we were lucky before uh, we, we start early compared with other Taiwanese media. So we occupied <laughs> the seats in their mind. And then we update at least once a week. So they will meet up again a week with us so we can have uh, our seat firmly in their uh, daily life. I think that's most challenging thing for us because we have only limited resources but to produce weekly an hour show uh, for, uh, from investigation stories. That's really hard. And the lesson, the fourth lesson we have, it's to engage your audience, your donors, uh, to consider them as your partners when you are doing podcasts, because it is much easier when you do podcasts to engage them rather than doing only text. So it's a huge opportunity for media to engage your donors or engage your audience or new to get new audience if you're having a podcast show because it's really easy to engage them and have them as your partner. So I see lots of potential here and that's why we are still learning. So that's the short uh, presentation from me and looking forward to more sharings and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna ask Ramsey Tesdell from Sout to go next. Ramsey is a major innovator as well. And we'd love to hear where, where things are at with you, Ramsey. So um, thank you, um, Jason, for that. That was great. I felt like I learned a lot, so I appreciated um, hearing everything you had to say as well. Um, I'm, I'm gonna come at it from uh, a couple of different angles, I guess. Um, um, I'll get into that a little bit, but I guess before I'll, uh, I'll introduce myself. Um, so my name is uh, Ramzi Tesdell, um, and I helped start a, a news magazine in 2007 um, called Hibir. It was It's about Jordan and it's still going. Um, and then I joined Arij, which is the Arab Reporters for Investigative Journalism. And this was my first experience uh, with investigative journalism. And I really enjoyed that. It was a very powerful learning experience. I was a part of a couple of the, the, the um, Arab regional conferences. Um, I didn't get to go to the global conference. There was one in Norway when I was working there, but I didn't get to go there. Um, but hopefully in the future, um, we can be physically together again. Um, and then after that, I started something called Sot. And Sot in Arabic means voice or sound, uh, depending on how it's voc uh, voweled. Um, and basically, we publish all things audio. We have a couple of different products. Um, Sot Plus is a, uh, is a subscription product. Uh, Safhat Sot is an audio articles. And then Zamakan is a uh, ad network. Um, and so the first kind of the two angles that it would be different, um, the way that I will present is we don't focus only on investigative journalism and we don't only have an investigative podcast. We're a podcast company um, and organization and we produce lots of different shows. Um, one and two, we're based in the Middle East. Um, we have an office in Amman, Jordan, and then we're also covering a lot of the region um, around the Arab world as well. Um, so those are kind of the two different things. We're about 18, 19 people now. We just had an in-person retreat. This is a picture from there. We all came together 
uh, just near the Dead Sea. Uh, it was really fun and much needed after being working on Zoom and Slack and whatnot the last couple of years. So just really quick, the opportunity or the market that we're looking at, um, there's about 400 million Arabic speakers um, scattered around the world, mostly in the Arab world, but there's a lot in Europe. Um, there's a lot in North America as well. Um, Arabic and audio go really well together. Um, there's religious traditions that are oral only, uh, previously oral that have been written down and kind of the hekawati or the storyteller is still a really important part of our culture. Um, and also I think this would be true across the region and across the world, but completion rates are higher. Uh, we see audiences sticking around, listening to the end of audio um, much longer than they would a video or uh, even reading an article or, or whatnot. Um, and radio really, I see the way I see it, audio is kind of the last mainstream media to di di digitize. Uh, so I think that's really important too. We've produced a bunch of you know, chart topping shows. We've been li listed as the year uh, shows of the year for Apple, um, for Deezer um, and for other places. And um, we've, you know, some of our shows have reached number one. So specifically, we're looking at about 400 million Arabic speakers. A lot of those are under 30 years old. So that's really interesting. Our target audience is really 18 to 60. Um, it's a wide range, um, but younger than that, we're looking at some younger kind of story products for younger. Um, and we've noticed people of all ages really engaging, but I think the core is really kind of 20 to 45, 50. Um, but we do have, you know, 60 plus, 60 plus, 70, 70 plus that listening is easier than reading maybe on a small screen. Um, and so there's interesting ways to look at that. The advertising is growing and obviously mobile phone presence uh, penetration is really important. We've worked with some big names, Facebook, Al Jazeera, Vice, uh, the EU, uh, Deezer on some big name projects. Um, so what's happening in the Arab world really quick, there's over uh, 1,200 uh, podcasts that are actively publishing right now. There's around 10, just over 10 kind of producers, major producers. There's a lot of individuals as well, obviously. Um, there's millions of listeners, and just in 2020, 2021, um, and I think this is a couple of months old, actually, there's 416 new podcasts, um, but you can see the pace of growth here uh, is dramatic, um, and 2021 was on pace to, to beat the years previous. So we have big growth, um, and it's exciting. It's a really exciting time. Um, so again, just some stats, the, the listing here are um, society and discussion is the top and the largest category. And then actually learning and culture, personal, general shows about work, um, self-development, et cetera, et cetera. And then actually the one, two, three, it's down on the list, the purple, um, the light purple towards the bottom is news. And so there aren't that many. Um, and they're not that popular so far, um, the news kind of an investigative. Um, again, here the 14, uh, 414, uh, 454 new shows, um, and then 32,000 episodes uh, so far. So just a couple of examples. We have a show called Menbit. It's a, it's a history show. Um, and we do first person kind of narrative storytelling with this. There's a narrator who tells the story um, and it's heavily researched, heavily narrated, um, heavily uh, edited um, and the sound production level is quite high. Um, we have another show called Dumtuck and what we're trying to do really with that is with like most of our shows, find a doorway into the discussion that we want to have. And so Dumtuck is really a way of taking music as that um, path or the window into the discussion that we want to have. And Dumtuck again is, is heavily uh, edited and heavily produced. We usually do seasons of 10 episodes um, is the way that we've typically done it. Um, and those will typically be published once a week. We're recently experimenting a lot with Apple subscriptions and subscription. Um, and what we're doing there is that you have 
uh, ad free. Um, so there's no ads on those and also uh, early access. So for example, Dumtak is publishing right now. And if you go, if you're a subscriber, you can listen to three or four episodes. If you're not a subscriber, I think there's just one or two. And so the um, subscriber only exclusive access comes online two to four weeks before um, everyone else. And this, you know, is really to maintain our independence, but also to generate some revenue so that we can, you know, tackle the topics that we want and be more fearless um, in our reporting and in our shows. Um, so investigative journalism, I mean, the main organization is Arij, I mentioned them. Um, Suzanne has, has presented in the conferences before. Um, they do mostly training, but they're publishing more and more. Um, they host a large annual conference every year. Uh, they bring together thousands of journalists, editors, trainers, uh, media development professionals, um, media executives. It's a really kind of important meeting and uh, you kind of have to be there. Um, in the Middle East, generally, it's a small, I would say, um, but lively and very engaged group of journalists that are focusing on investigative journalism. Um, as in many places of the world, I think there's many issues and problems to investigate. Um, and so uh, it's much needed. For our intervention, um, what we did is in that list of shows, there were basically no investigative uh, news shows um, in Arabic. There's a couple that are more kind of true crime, looking at um, various crimes that have happened, serial killers, things like that. Um, but there aren't that are uh, that self-describe or what I would call as investigative. Um, so what we're doing is we we're producing two seasons at the same time of a new show. Uh, it's going to be called The Case or Hale in Arabic. Um, and there'll be five to six episodes each. Um, and if you can guess from the picture, you can guess which uh, country one of the first, ep first seasons will be about. Um, and each season will kind of tackle one case and it will be serialized. Um, I guess we haven't mentioned serial yet, but there's a good chance to, to do that. Um, and what we're trying to do, the way we're positioning this um, is maybe a little different um, or maybe not from other people, but what we're looking at is we're looking at human rights as a base positioning. So we use a human rights approach for the research. We use human um, rights uh, as positioning, um, but in line with our goals to reach as many people as possible um, with investigative, critical, thought-provoking content. Um, we also want it to be extremely engaging and entertaining. Um, and so we're placing it within the true crime genre. And so basically what that means is it will, we will have characters, uh, we will have a story, uh, there'll be plot, there'll be antagonists, um, you know, there will be good guys, bad guys um, to simplify a little bit. Um, and throughout uh, all the shows that we do, and especially in this, the power of podcast really comes through because the audio narrative uh, storytelling really comes through with this. So that's kind of the idea with our forthcoming show. Um, and I don't have any clips. I, I could have brought clips from other things, um, but um, I, I will at some point love to share this with you all. Um, and then the other example that I wanna do, and then I'll just jump into a few other slides. Um, there's another forthcoming serialized podcast I can't say a lot about it and I feel kind of bad even talking about it because we can't say much about it yet. It's not, we're working on it with a major podcast um, production company um, and they are, we're, we're working together on kind of a cross border investigation that inc includes multiple countries, um, multiple families, multiple people. Um, and we've been working on the investigation in Jordan and that's been fascinating for many reasons, um, just the framing, we would frame things differently, they would frame things differently, coming from different countries, very different perspectives. There was also a very fascinating timeline that we were trying to put together. You know, the, the characters would kind of disappear and pop up in different countries and different times. And it was pretty uh, difficult to get all that figured out. Um, but we're, we're super excited about it. Um, and hopefully it will be on 
major platforms uh, soon. And then just a few tips just to kind of wrap up. The power of pod, podcast power and the power of audio really is it's personal, it's emotional, um, powerful storytelling tool. And this is what I think you know is so powerful about investigative journalism generally and podcasts specifically. Um, we are insisting that it's research fact-checked and relevant. Um, and it's also safer for sources um, like Jason's example. You know, you don't have to show their face uh, you can change their voice. Um, and so researching and talking about really sensitive topics uh, politically um, and things that are dangerous, uh, it's really important to protect uh, your sources. So I just have a few uh, tips and ideas about how to fund your investigative um, podcast. And basically, you know, they're basic ideas, but sometimes simple and basic is a great place to start. So start with you know, organizations, individuals, and look at their previous projects. Um, research them as much as you can. Make sure you know as much about them um, before you approach them. If it's an organization that is only focusing on environment and not media, maybe there isn't a way there. But what we've been able to do is a lot of times donor, um, donor um, priorities uh, will line up with different podcasts. And so, gender, um, environment, investigation, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure you know who the person is and look through uh, organizations that they've previously funded. Really be active and network as much as you can. Um, set up meetings um, and invite people that might be good and on, on, on organizations to be mentors and an advisory board. Um, and then really build relationships. Uh, communicate often and effectively. Understand that funding is a long game. It can take a lot of time sometimes. Sometimes you start really small and go forward. Um, and then I think the last question there is what would you do with the money? Be prepared to answer that. Sometimes you get lucky and they're like, what would you do? And then also that is a good segue into what Jason and other organizations are doing by being crowdfunded and subscription. This really ties your relationship to the listener much more closely and much, much more tightly than it has in the past. Um, and it's something that we can have constant feedback, which is good and sometimes overwhelming, but generally a, a good thing. I think I should wrap up. Um, yeah, and then network, network, network. You know, that's basically the big, big idea there, so. Thank you, Ramsey. Um, I just wanted to give you guys all a heads up that there's about 109 people right now participating, which is very cool. Um, so I really appreciate you getting us up to date with what's going on in your space, Ramsey. And I'm going to hand things over right now to Taya, who's joining us from Slovenia, also has a startup and I think has done a lot of um, global conferences, if I'm right. I think you've actually been a participant. So we'll hand it over to you. Uh, so yeah, hi everyone from Slovenia. I'm uh, very excited to talk about uh, here because I think that our situation or our situation when we started our podcast is very similar to many listeners who are here in the session today. Uh, I'm a co-founder, editor in chief, and chief and CEO of uh, nonprofit uh, media for investigative journalism here in Slovenia. And we started uh, our organization seven years ago and podcasting four years ago. So, I mean, originally we are not podcasters originally we are investigative journalists and doing investigative journalism of um, publishing them in the form of long stories and then after three years we moved into the into podcasting uh, our idea when we started podcasting was like was that you know podcasts will be kind of a complementary um, product we have for our uh, readers who are like more most invested readers and our donors because as Jason uh, mentioned like you know we we started the idea that yeah we are donor based we are uh, uh, we are uh, supported by readers so it will be it will be really nice to develop this personal personalized uh, product where we can actually talk directly to them so this was the this, this was the idea when we started but as we would see it kind of proved wrong a bit uh, so our podcast is investigative podcast. We started, uh, as I said, four years ago with the idea that we will produce monthly episode uh, on one of our investigative stories. So each story we uh, broadcasted in our podcast was always like, you know, 
previously investigated. We did not investigate just purely for the podcast. So it was like a kind of a joint project, investigate um, mostly investigative series that was also produced as a podcast. Um, so as I said, uh, we started the idea that, you know, that podcast is like the product, not for the for the larger audiences, but specifically for our donors and people who are already our fans. And we started with really small team because our organization is originally very small. Uh, at the moment, we have four, uh, four full-time employees and like another five to six people are project-based. So it's still a very small organization. And we do not do just podcasts. We do investigative series as well with, that are published as articles, as I mentioned. Um, and when, but when we started, we had like, you know, um, we knew some things. Uh, we Natalia, I'm sorry to interrupt, but nobody can see your uh, your screen, so I'm not sure if you're aware of that. I just thought I'd point it out. Um, so maybe hmm. interesting because if just... you just have to go to the right um, the right window, and I I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, no, no, I will just do that again. I'm I apologize because I see the screen. Can you see it now? You have to double click to enter full screen. It, it just isn't showing anything at all. Um, okay, I'm not yeah. sure why. Give me a second, like, I mean, but this is, I mean, this is the classical example of life. Uh, yes, perfect, <laughs> perfect oh. example of how things normally work. Like there is, there is yeah. some... Um, the toad is jumping in saying, we can't see you. Your team, <laughs> your team is egging you on. So um, hopefully we can, we can switch, switch it in. It's just not showing. Oh, well. Um, okay, can you see it now? No, <laughs> just not sure. Okay, just just give me. I have no idea what to do. I'm really sorry. Well, uh, you know what? Maybe you should stop sharing and just tell us your story because it's probably mm -hmm. just as fascinating to hear what your experiences are <laughs> and your learning. I'm sure people will be fine with that. Okay, let's see. Does it work now? Because maybe the problem is the sound. Does it work? Nope, can't see a thing. Sorry. So well, then let's just work with audio as we more normally do. <laughs> so um, uh, you will be able to see the presentation. I think it will be published. So there are kind of, let's um, kind of, some of the um, behind the scenes photos in the in the presentation, but now we will have to stick to sound um, as it would happen with the podcast. So when we started in 2017, we actually had two team members on board for this podcast project and it, and it was kind of a pet project at the beginning, like it was me and my, uh, my co-host, Leonard. And we had a lot of limitations. We had no equipment, so we actually borrowed it. Uh, we had really basic experience with audio production, like uh, in uh, from radio journalism and uh, partly from 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 podcasting. Uh, we had no specific funding for podcast production, and our podcasting market in Slovenia is really small. You have to know that we. Um, speak about 2 million people who speak Slovenian language and like half of them are kids so they aren't listening to investigative podcasts uh, and as I said we are extremely small media organizations so we were so we were like okay we really have to streamline that and streamline that and be very very focused uh, to be able to um, to produce that so uh, what I would what I would want to talk ab about is um, like let's call it six steps that you can use if you want to start your own podcast as a very small media organization, uh, probably non-profit one. Um, and um, I decided to talk about it because like this is kind of the most requested um, topic people normally want to discuss in live when we meet on the conferences. So I thought that maybe like, let's talk that uh, about that online this time. Uh, so I would say that the first step is to know why you want to produce podcast, where you uh, where you are as an individ individual organization or team that is you know starting this pro podcast production and what is your idea, uh, because I think that you know if everyone else is producing podcasts, this is not good enough reason to start your own production, uh, especially because 
as you would see, yeah, like you plan how much time and effort will go into podcast production and then you have to triple that in the end. I mean, and this is probably like still very conservative, um, cons conservative time management estimate. Um, another, another step that I would say it's good to take is like pick what you will focus on. Because like, you know, podcast, as Susan mentioned, and uh, also Jason and Ramsey before, is like, you know, really it's like fast growing market where people are, and people are entering it from different points. Like, you know, there is high end production, there is just indie, like low cost production, and we are all talking to different audiences. And, you know, you cannot just learn, you know, pick that you will be good in everything. Um, just like pick one thing. So what we start, uh, what we uh, what we decided initially to focus on was like you know that we want to do this very factual podcast that is not too chatty, and that has good sound because you we were like okay, this is only sound we are working with, right? So the sound really has to be very good, and this is why we initially like in the beginning when there was just two of us in the team, we uh, initial uh, we immediately added audio engineer and audio designer in one person because you're like, we want good sound. Another, and when you like you know, picked your thing is like, I would say, do not overthink and prototype because unfortunately th there is, you know, there is just one way to move forward when you're the beginner and this is to like, you know, try it out, learn and get better over time. Step three um, is that, you know, we have to know that you just started doing something new. Like, you know, you've probably been doing journalism for years, editing work for years. So, and now you're doing something completely new and you have to be ready to make mistakes and learn. And uh, what I find like kind of um, useful is, you know, when I think about podcasts, podcasts are quite different from investigative stories. With investigative stories, like, you know, there is a whole layout. So there is like, you know, people are, you know, are not just following you when they read, they do not follow you word by word, but with podcasts, they're actually standing with you in this dark, uh, dark, empty room. They do not see anything. And you are coming to them, like, just word by word, and they would have to be able to, to follow you. Aha, uh -huh, now I see my own presentation. I hope, I don't know what is, uh, if that works for you. Aha. Uh -huh. um, we can okay, see the presentation. We'll have, we'll have to oh. move uh, a few slides uh, uh, to the next slide. Um, yeah, we are here at step three. And um, there is one thing that uh, Jason also mentioned, like, you know, working with your audience, with your community. Uh, when we produced first, six, after we produced first 16 podcasts, we got in touch with our community and asked them, what is the one specific team thing we should change in our podcast? I think you have to be very specific because people have many ideas, many, uh, many, I mean, and they may be, might be great, but they may, they might not be doable for you because you do not have funding or you do not have equipment or you do not have people to do that. Uh, but if you're very specific with your question, you get specific advice. And what we got from this survey with our readers who wrote to us via emails was that, you know, that they're very, very specific about sound. They were like, they're, they were like, okay, we are listening to your podcast in the cars when we commute. And like, you know, every sound you use that is not very clear or is too loud, like, you know, no, not too equal with the, with the other sounds in the podcast is very, very distracting while we drive. Fix that. This was one, uh, the one thing. And the other thing that we found out was that, you know, that people were like, yeah, we are actually like, you know, we see you're publishing a story, uh, a new series, for example, or investigative series, and we wait for the podcast. So it was like an interesting realization. Okay, we actually made the wrong assumption. People who are listening to the podcast maybe didn't read um, the uh, the story. So we have to be like very, like, you know, very focused in, in telling the story in audio because they're hearing it for the first time. Uh, for uh, fourth step is that you know now you know you start it and you know that podcast production takes a lot of time uh, and it's I mean enthusiasm is great but you have to put some structure in place because you will not be able to continue and produce like week after week if you're very enthusiastic or month after month uh, and I would say there is no need for perfection just like you know go with anything that works for your team and yourself 
uh, because you will, ch you know, when the podcast will grow, when the podcast will change, you will just, you know, have to tweak the proce process itself. For us, it is very important that we fact check our podcasts because we fact check our stories. You know, this is not enough. When you like, you know, transfer your material into the podcast, this is completely different thing. You have to fact check again. Uh, and another thing is that you have kind of outside listeners, like they could be, they can be play a part of your team. Uh, but they should not be involved in the production. They have to just like, you know, be able to listen to the podcast in a file and form and say, okay, this is not logical or this does, or this doesn't sound good. Mm. Okay, uh, this picture here. So, you know, we started with just like, you know, some bullet points and we started to record and we were recording for hours and hours because we, it was trial and error. And after four years, we came to the moment that, you know, that we have everything scripted and like we are able to record like 25 minutes long podcast in 25 minutes, but we work on scripts for for weeks so like you know it's it's what you choose uh, but uh, what is interesting is that you know that more uh, if more your content is more complex uh there is more and more scripting and writing and editing like you're working with text more than you work with uh, with uh, with audio in the end and um uh, what you saw is also like, you know, that this color coding we use, like, for example, some are clips that we edited, uh, some are things that we removed from the podcast, some are some like, you know, specific colors that are for audio engineer to like, you know, check. So uh, this is this is our system at the moment. Uh, another thing, another step, step five. Um, I would say not to not start if you're a small organization with like, you know, very huge team because you do not know what you need at the moment so first start prototyping and then start developing your team as i mentioned we started with you know uh two of us and uh, uh and audio engineer and then we added other people into the into the mix when we saw what our preferences are where uh what the development of the podcast is uh but i think that like I mean, it's an op there is an op option that you're like a very multi-talented person and you're, you know, one person behind the podcast, but mostly podcasts are teamwork. Um, and uh, yeah, just let's up uh, with uh, important disclaimer that, you know, all these uh, things that I shared or these uh, are kind of starting points. Um, for you if you're thinking about it but that your ideas your circumstances and your culture environment can be much more different uh and are very diverse and it can mean that like you know that many of the, those tips are completely uh, unuseful for you and it's okay because i think that you know that uh, we we get can get inspired from each other and take what we need but like you know what you will produce uh, what we, you create is like completely like it's it's your own original creation so it's normal that uh, not everything will be useful um can we just go to the to slide number 20 where we are now so um as i said when we started four years ago we had some initial ideas but then in exchange for example uh, we started with this, like, you know, let's call it talking podcast. And now in 2021, we are moving into producing investigative series, uh, which are a completely different thing from, um, you know, talking about your material or having some guests on your podcast, because you have to have characters, you have to have a lot of field work, uh, uh, a lot of good tape. And I would say that, like, you know, pot our podcast is, is getting more and more um, um, character driven and more and more uh, tape driven and this actually brings me to point one of my whole uh, whole presentation because you know when you do one circle of your like you know development of your podcast you're actually in the in the point one again because you re-evaluate uh, you find out what works for you what doesn't work how like you know the audience audience change how the circumstances circumstances changed and what is this next, next one thing you can focus on? And what can you develop in the future? Um, I think it was, that was my 10 minutes. So thank you very much. Thank you, Taya. So we got it together in the end, right? So I'm <laughs> like, and uh, I really wanna, I'm gonna stop sharing. I think you guys have done incredible um, innovation. I'm gonna, Quickly, I'm wrap up here. I don't have that much to add. 
Um, I think, let me just see where would I like to, um, where would I like to start? Um, okay. Um, now I can't tell if you can see, I have to stop this thing. Um, can you guys see my screen now? Don't even know. Can you see my screen? No, we can't. You can? Nope. nope. We cannot. Cannot. Okay. All right. Let's just uh, share the screen. Here we go. All right. Okay. So um, can you guys hear me, see the screen, etc.? All good. All right. Good. Um, you know, I think I will just start with what is sort of basically my 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 main takeaway. Obviously, our show. Uh, let's see. Let's just quickly go back here. Um, we have a show uh, called Verified. Uh, Verified is the second investigative podcast that I started. Um, the first one was Reveal. It's a weekly show. It's still going strong. Um, it has a good team based out of California, but it's a it was actually the first investigative podcast for in the United States. Um, when I left Reveal, I really wanted to try uh, what would happen uh, with investigations in a serialized form, which of course was really hot after serial started. But for us, it was also about taking um, a hold of an audience that is really active in podcasting. And Ramsey, you kind of hinted at it, which is call it the true crime audience. True crime is one of the biggest slices of the podcast audience, which we already know is a young audience. It's a very loyal audience. And what I was trying to play around with is the idea of, could we take that true crime audience, kind of twist, twist the format and use it for investigative reporting, but from kind of twist the format because a lot of true crime is really about the bad guy. And we decided that we would make our story very much about the women, the survivors, the investigators who had to fight back to get to get justice, which of course is a very journalistic thing to be doing. Um, and so our tagline for season one of Verified was, you know, it's a story about not a story about victims, it's a story about women who fight back. And actually the theme of sort of empowerment, um the characters driving the action is still very much how we go about selecting our stories um and i'm just gonna you know so we let the women uh drive the story it's a story about a a, a, a cop who basically drugged and, and abused and raped uh 14 women who then brought him to justice and got a conviction and so here you can see our, our two lead characters, Kate on the left, Maria on the right. They were actually, the, they drove the investigation. Many of the other women who were part of this movement participated, worked with us. We did interviews, but we really had to cast our characters and choose carefully. And that's kind of where I want to uh, start. Our second season was about the Johnson & Johnson baby powder. I'm sure you guys can catch up on what some of the shows are about because I just want to quickly go to, you know, what is the, what is sort of the main heartbeat of a show like this? And in the serialized format, which we're obviously now in season, we're going into season three, that's kind of our format. The key thing, and Taya knows this, we've done a bit of work together on their podcast, is, is the characters. I mean, if you don't have them, it's going to be really tough. Um, and so we spend a lot of time looking for stories that have plot, that have people who are doing things, trying to get justice, right or wrong. Sometimes the stories are heavily reported already and we add reporting. And this season, it's actually our own original investigation. But with, you know, I just have to say, you know, if you, if you can, what Jason was saying, the personalities of the people, whether they come from your community, from the investigative community. Um, it's just the key, key thing. And the other thing I, I, I really appreciated about Jason uh, talking about being driven first by the audience. And I think a lot of times as journalists, especially investigative journalists, we get very focused on the reporting. And honestly, I would really encourage you to think about what is the audience experiencing? What is the experience of your story? When are their highs? When are their lows? Try to really think about it from their perspective as you're going into it. 
as you're picking the characters, um, are they representative of another group of people? Like really think about what it's like to experience your show. And the other, you know, thing we we do with our with our scripts is, of course, we write scripts and of course we plot everything out, but but we listen, we listen to everything, and I you just have to be open to like if something's not working when you're doing that listening session, you have to change it because you, if it's not making sense to even the people in your team, chances are it's not going to make sense to the audience, and so I just trust your ears, trust your tape. Um, and, and remember that audio is actually a very intimate medium. It is a medium that is full of the sights and sounds of our world. You can bring people into that world. You can make twists and turns very quickly with the tape because our brains are built for narrative and we will fill in the blanks. And uh, much like when you read a book, you're imagining a lot of what's going on. And, um, you know, it will de demand of you a lot of discipline. I think Taya got at that. With serialized shows, you cannot get away with just waiting till the end and start writing a piece. Like you really have to know what is our structure. Um, and we use story mapping to do this. Um, we try and imagine like, what is the journey of the listener as they're going through the show? Um, we write out our scenes. We literally listen to our tape, like what's going on in that scene. We map it out. This was our first season on our wall of our studio. And having done now, this is like, you know, multiple seasons of different shows, two seasons of Verified, season of Sold in America and some other shows. I'm more and more focused on what is the beginning and what is the end. And I think often like the ending is the thing none of us want to talk about. Um, but without an ending, it's kind of hard to plan. Like what is the, what is the kind of payoff for your audience? So if you can think about not necessarily how investigative stories don't tend to end, they keep going, there's a long tail, but where does your story end? Where are you going to come out of the action? I think that's a really important thing. In uh, season one, we actually had a scene there. You see the gelato. Cecilia um, is eating the gelato. That was the, the thing, the celebration at the end when they won um, their case. And we included that as one of the scenes and it was a happy moment in a very sad story. So, um, you know, keep recording, think of your characters. And at the end of the day, you know, how does your host work? We have a host, our host is Natasha Del Toro. How does the host feature in the action? Where can she become involved? often we'll get Natasha to work with us on the scenes where we can't figure things out and often she's doing real-time experience. Uh, for instance, in our first season, couch surfing was the platform that a lot of these women would, would you know, they went off and they stayed with, uh, with this police officer near Venice. They found it through couch surfing. Couch surfing never talked to us. But we built one of the most memorable scenes in the podcast because Natasha went on couch surfing and became a verified host in about 30 seconds. And that was just one of those extreme moments where it was like, I remember she did it on, on the computer. We recorded in real time. We didn't let her plan it out. And, and when she did it, I remember she just said, holy crap, you know, I'm, I'm verified. And, and so you can create these moments with obviously your hosts, your, your uh, characters, but also your reporters. Um, this is uh, Chechi and Julio talking to the prosecutor in the couch surfing case, obviously recording everything. Um, and for this season and in, in season three coming up uh, January, we had a very tricky story because it's the first time we've done a real live, you know, investigation where we're recording and we're researching, which is not to be advised. It's very hard. Um, but at the same time, we realized very quickly that our entry point was going to have to be our reporter. Um, and so I'm just going to quickly play you guys a little sneak peek here of, um, of uh, our season three coming up. Time. Why would someone hate another human being so much just because of his skin color? or whatever makes us different. 
In the decades since Marcus's murder, Americans have made some progress in addressing racism. But now it feels like white supremacists are out in the open again in ways I've not seen since I was a girl. And it feels like the country is backsliding. In fact, the FBI says hate crimes have surged to a 12-year high, more than 7,000 cases in 2020 alone. So where is all this hate coming from? Why is it bubbling up now? And what does it mean? These are the questions the Verified Reporting team set out to answer. And what we discovered is a bigger and more complex web than you can imagine. This season, we go from the United States, across Europe, and all the way to Russia to uncover a dangerous network united in a global fight for white power. And we meet some of the brave people fighting back. I'm your host, Natasha Del Toro. This is Verified, the next threat. So we have waded into the very dangerous territory of uh, extremism coming up January 2022. So I think we're going to wrap it up there. Um, and, and I want to just thank our panelists for being so candid about everything you've learned. And I think this is the moment where we get to ask uh, everybody if you have questions. Um, thank you also for your patience with some of our uh, switching around in our, our presentations, that's real life too, but these guys are pros. So um, if you guys have questions, I'd love for us to have spend the last 10 minutes just getting to your top questions. If you want to put them into, into the chat. Um, so we've got a question from Friska. Are you thinking that investigative podcast has a change to bring a new era for journalism? Um, well, I think, let me, why don't I let, uh, you know, Ramsey, do you want to take a crack at that one? Do you think that um, investigative podcasting is bringing a change to journalism? I mean, sure, I can take a, a quick crack, but I, I mean, I think uh, podcast is opening up a lot of interesting uh, reporting and uh, ways to connect with the audience. I think that it goes both ways. I think journalists are changing and I think the audiences, the audiences are changing as well. And so I definitely think there's a new um, space uh, in journalism for podcasting. I think what's really interesting in Jason's story is that how a podcast enabled them to fundraise uh, and not from you know mega donors or whatnot, but from the listeners. And that, you know, that, that, and I'd love to hear more, Jason, but the 95% um, of, of people who filled out the survey said they wanted a podcast. I think that's, that's brilliant um, work. So I definitely think that it opens up lots of opportunities for both journalists and for audience audiences. And I think that's really important. So I would definitely say it's an exciting space. Is it a new era? I, I'm definitely not one to, to make that claim. So well, I think I'll I'll add one quick beat there because I actually do think, especially for the for the audience that we have here today, for investigative reporting, which is already kind of a chase, a hunt to find certain things out. I couldn't think of a better format, frankly, than invest than using podcasting, because a it actually addresses the audience's need to go along for the ride. Um, it is obviously cheaper than video. <laughs> Even though I'm not saying it's 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 you know if you have high production values it doesn't mean it, it it's not going to cost you money, but the audience is definitely into um, the kind of investigation part, and I think that's why Jason's point about recording everything is so important. If you don't capture those scenes that actually allow the audience to come into that, it's really hard to kind of retrofit it later. You know, creating scenes when you weren't there or you didn't roll tape makes it much, much harder. It's not that you can't do it, but it does it does make it harder. I'm going to quickly see if there's other questions. Um, okay, Norman asks us, wondering what are the key important advice when it comes to producing investigative stories on podcasts? 
I like the idea of a short story series, sorry. And on that point, how do we, how do you make your content more engaging? Taya, over to you. How do you make your content more engaging? I th well, I would say there are many like different approach different creative approach, uh, approaches you uh, you could use. For example, one thing is that you know uh, and I think it's kind of related to the to the things you already talked about as the answer to the last question. You know, when you look at the story you investigated and maybe even published before from the perspective of the podcast, you know, there are like hidden things in inside that you did not publish as a written story. So, I, so like, you know, this is like things that are, might, might be very interesting for your um, listeners, because like, you know, I think that one of the powerful tools in podcasting is that you can actually take people, your listeners to the places with you. Like it can be physical places and the experience of physical space, or it can be mental mental spaces and like you know things that happened in history and 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 are now part of like you know characters' history, for example. Um, for example, we did one very interesting podcast. Like the last episode we published, we actually like my thought my my uh, one of my. Um, team members was on the bike like you know and we took our listeners with us on a bike ride around the city to show them how polluted with the with the advertisement city actually is you know it's like you, know, you can show it with data and you know data is like you know it's it's, it's telling like you know we can visualize it but you can also like take your listeners with you in the space and let them experience you know what the city is really like for example this is not investigative story itself it's more it's more data driven but like you know it's very interesting uh and, and i would say also that like you know that you know that it, it kind of that podcasting actually like forces us to think about stories that we maybe uh, already investigated through um a very different, very new perspective, finding like things that were more, maybe overlooked, like, you know, people who played important parts in the change, maybe in systemic change, but were overlooked in the, like, you know, in this uh, um, fact-based uh, fact database stories, mm -hmm. but they're actually, like, you know, characters who, who, were, who were driving the change from the behind. So I think that uh, this is one important thing. All right, I have a question from Abigail. What is the best way to choose what you want an investigative podcast to be about? Is it more what the journalist sees or is, does it come from the audience in some way? And I'm going to let Jason answer that one since you do both. What, how do you think, how would you answer that question? Um, thank you for the questions. Uh, it's not always a conflict between uh, what we are pursuing for some certain topics. You, it, it's an art to find a balance. Of course, everyone knows about that, but there are lots of debate between our team. We will see the questions or the needs from the audience, but we, we have the questions we want to ask. So uh, what we do is that we, we will produce like two or three episodes with uh, the same topic. So the, maybe the first one or two would be focusing on our investigation, the topic or news lead we want to investigation on. But then you get the feedback from the audience. They will ask also oh, what, what happened when blah, 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 blah. So for example, we have a, a long investigation on the online gambling industry. So there's a cross-border online gambling industry between Taiwan, Philippines, and China, and in the Southeast Asia. So we went into the company, we investigate on how they're doing this business, how the money flows across borders. But then we have feedback from, uh, from a doctor. He, he is the, one of our audience. He said, you should really introduce what happened when you involved in uh, online gambling. What, what is the harm to the brand, to the people and how they suffer and how they can control themselves from the online gambling industry. So we invite the, the doctor onto the show because he's a pro, but we invite other people who is suffering from gambling and he has the disease and he went to the doctor and see what's happening. So in the end, it's three episodes about online gambling and one episode is from our audience and he answers the 
the other part of the questions from the audience. So uh, that's our way to, to find a balance between the audience needs and the news they will investigate on. So I would say that the key is to have conversation with your audience. So, and the conversation is not only to listen, but it's a real conversation. You tell them what you're thinking and what you're investigating on, and then they will let you know, like from the aspect from the audience, uh, what they want to know furthermore. So I think that's a way to build out the, uh, the trust and the relationship between your team and the audience. And if the balance would be there once you got the relationship with them. I have another question here from Chrissy. Uh, Chrissy says, do you think the audience for these podcasts are general public or fellow investigative reporters? How do you balance sharing the investigation as it happens with not becoming too inside baseball? I'm going to take one minute crack at that and say, in my view, the point of the investigative podcast is certainly, in my view, going for the general audience and really sharing with them the public service journalism that you've done. Um, and, and of course, that then demands us that, in fact, we can't be too inside baseball. We have to make it about the experience. And I think that's why I'm so keen on discussing characters, because if there's no entry point for the for the listener to understand, like what's what are these sort of ordinary people facing extraordinary situations? What's it like? Because we as journalists, we get our stories because other people have actually done things or experienced things. So uh, that's my answer. But Taya, you how would you see? Uh, I think you know, you guys had, you had a bit of a journey. How do you balance, uh, do you, who are you making your podcast for now? Um, I mean, absolutely a general audience, but we still know that, for example, here in Slovenia, like podcasting audience is not like general in itself. It's, it's a bit specific. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, with, as with all the work we do, like there is a lot of like things you have to kind of balance. On one hand, you want a good story, but on the other hand, you are like, you know, you have to um, take care of your reporters, you have to take care of your of your sources, you cannot overexpose them. Uh, and for example, when we started to work with characters, like for example, in our culture, this is really not the thing. Like, you know, people are not like really willing to go and talk to media. This is not, I mean, this is like, you do not go and, you know, and they're also not, Many times, like you have to record and record and record, and you do not get good tape because people are not used to tell their stories. Uh, so you have to get creative, like you know, like um, just use part part of the tape and tell their stories in your words. Or even sometimes you have characters you have to completely hide their identity, even with like you know voiceovers and stuff, because like you know you're working in a small small cultural space when people can't be recognized just because of their voice and some like, you know, minor details you added to the story. So I think, you know, I think that, you know, yeah, you, you want, for example, good characters, you want people to be able to identify with your story. And sometimes it's really hard when you talk about re really abstract things or really like, you know, things that are not really graspable. But uh, on the other hand, like, you know, you not cannot or expose your sources. So you have to find a, a solution that works. I'm going to let Ramsey take the last question here because it does focus on that same issue that that Taya rose. We have a question here from Ava and Ava is asking uh, you, your podcast is centered around issues that are typically avoided in the public sphere mm. and markets and how it's able to break that down discomfort. How do you get your interviewees comfortable speaking about such difficult topics and how do you ensure their safety and privacy given the taboo nature of the interviews? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And I think audio uh, specifically is perfect for these types of conversations. Um, if you look, at, and so to get people to talk, I mean, you have to build a relationship and it takes time. You can't build that instantly. At the very least, there's a pre-interview call. Um, but with a lot of the stories for Aib uh, specifically, you need to spend a lot of time building that relationship with that person so that they trust you and so that they feel comfortable um, telling their story and also that they, they tell it in an engaging way um, while they're being recorded. Um, sometimes, I mean, it's really hard, you know, if you ask someone about their first sexual experience, for example, and you have cameras and lights and whatnot, a lot of people will kind of freak out. 
um, at that. But even with a microphone in a very comfortable, safe environment, people will change the way that they act. Um, and so that's really important to break that and uh, work with them as much as possible to do that. But audio is perfect for that. You know, you can have that personal, intimate conversation um, and it works really well. There's another question that says, is it safer for the for the for the the sources, but for the journalist? That's a great question. I've never had that flipped um, on me in that way. And it's an interesting thing to to think about. I think at, at the very least, journalists and especially investigative journalists are they're in they know what they're getting into at least partly um so hopefully that they're also being uh careful and protecting themselves as well um but yeah that's a it's a great question folks i think we need to wrap this up um thank you everybody for all the preparation you've done and sharing with us today um there are some um quite frequent stories on the Global Investigative Journalism Network pod, uh, website um, that have done different shout outs to, to investigative stuff. So hopefully you can take a look at that. Investigative podcasting has been written up and we appreciate that very much. And so I just wanna thank everybody again. And um, hopefully you guys will, uh, who've been on this panel will go off and start making podcasts if you're not already. And certainly, I uh, can't wait to hear what you're doing. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.